Welcome. My name is Penelope Chatterton. Welcome to Awaken the Dream. My friends, I want to talk about a book by Joel Goldsmith today. It's called A Parenthesis in Eternity. It's the first one that, I, that hit me over the head and it says everything, like all his books do. I say that about every book I've ever read. It feels like I've never read it before. It is so profound and simple and hard at the same time. And before I get rolling, I want to give a special thanks to a Chris Bentley, who is an Infinite Way teacher student. His website will be brought up on the lower third, so if you're all interested in Joel's work, if you pull up iwstudents.webs.com, you will find some wonderful information because Chris, like many of us, is on the path. He is committed to the Infinite Way movement. He is a Joel Goldsmith teacher and um, I'm very proud of him and he's done a lot for me so thank you Chris and I will now get on with a parenthesis now I think Joel's trying to help us in this book and please know these are my words not Joel's I'm just inspired by what this book has given me he tries to get us started in what generations upon generations ago have been telling us about what this humanhood this mankind, this earth plane is all about. We have been dealing for generations with a projected illusional dream state, which is what this planet looks like, the illusion of what planet earth is doing. We human beings seem to be locked in to appearances, to greed, to health, to good, to bad, to um, anything that we can make up about one another that has, frankly, the base of fear. Uh, it's not a comfortable planet to live on if we believe everything that our projected minds show us. We decided centuries ago to be separate from God. So I'll go back to that first chapter in Genesis where everything was hunky-dory, everybody was happy, everybody was joined and eternal. Apparently in that old second chapter, humanity decided maybe I have an idea of my own and maybe I'll go off and see what I can create. And he separated himself from this eternal circle of joy, goodness, health, perfection. Everything was so easy, there was no separation. So as he went down this little road, he created this form called the world of appearance. And we did that, and it wasn't the happiest time because what we set up was a lot of strife, a lot of illness. We looked at life and death as possible. We weren't looking at the parenthesis, which was coming in for one trip. This is my parenthesis here. It's a journey to the earth plane for a short period of time as we are taken out of this circle where we belong originally in that first chapter. We decided we'd skip out. And it's kind of interesting that Joel Goldsmith as a mystic, like Jesus, like uh, Elisha, Elijah, Moses, um, Paul, the mystics forever, in centuries before even Jesus arrived on the scene, that were, were creating miracles by the knowledge of their eternal nature. So Joel is trying to help us get back to what is truly ourselves. Okay, so here we are, trying to look out at appearances and trying to recognize what it really means. Now, if we can accept the fact that we did separate from God and that we're not thinking about our eternal nature all the time, and we have ideas of our own, it sort of sets up the whole problem that we have. How do we get home? I think for many of us and myself, when I read a parenthesis in eternity, I saw so many degrees of my own growth. The first degree where I wrestled, like many of us, with the truth of what am I looking at? If we really want to work on our spirituality, what we are studying and learning is I can shift my perception. I can take a look at what I've created and I can turn it around and I can see what's real. So I think Joel was trying to tell us in this first degree that that's what our mission is. We do a lot of hard work. Often it comes from illness, addiction, um, lust, anything that 
tries to fill a void. I don't know anyone who hasn't gone somewhere on their journey who is a mystical soul who hasn't had to deal with the pain of their own creation. And I'm positive all of these addictions, all of these diseases are us trying to remember. We're homesick, so we try and fill voids with people, with toys, with gifts, with wealth, with food, liquor, drugs. We're just desperately trying to go home, only we don't maybe understand it at the time, and we may suffer many, many years of trying to heal. So with trying to heal in mind, we have spiritual work that can inspire us. Also, let's face it, our suffering is the greatest teacher. As we reach within, as we discover the world within, in this first degree, we are now being able to see that if I can reinterpret what I'm looking at and fill it with this beautiful energy within that's light, it's whole, it's peaceful, it has a vibration and a vortex that is so incredibly beautiful. It fills us to the point where it's, it's beyond words. But we keep touching on that. It's not as though, and once in a while we might get a big one, we get little wax, little, uh, little visions, something coming from within that's saying you're on the right track. So we don't give up. When we go within, we get gifts. They, and they're on many degrees, on many levels, but whatever it is, it's what we're ready for. Because this journey with our Christ mind, which by the way, when we went out from the Garden of Eden, we did not go alone. That is the most important thing to remember. Jesus Christ left Jesus the man to say, it's my Christ mind that I wanna share with you. It's what you all have. Now, it's fine to worship him. I, it's part of the journey, but for those who want to understand their own nature and their own possibility, the mystics of the past and the mystic that Jesus was, all I know is so few got it. He picked up 12 disciples, and even they were unsure. They followed him because their intuition said, you know, he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. But so few got it because even at the time of his crucifixion, those he had even healed were there crying, crying, let's crucify him. So that's how tough this journey is. And I say the principles are simple, but the journey is hard because we have to work our way through all of this. We have to be diligent. Okay, let's talk about the diligence of soul. The discipline of soul, which is in the beginning of every Joel's book, there's a sentence in there, is this is what is required of us. We need to go within. We need to meditate and die daily to all of our illusions, to all of our fears. Now that's a big job. So we get pretty good at it as we begin to see our outer appearances, our outer experience begins to get easier. Things are falling into place for us when we least expected it from doing this inner work. And that's what keeps us going, is the experience we have from the work that we're doing. So we go within, we go without. We go within, we go without. We're on this journey where back and forth, in this first degree, I think it's fair to say, we do our best to meet the challenge of seeing what we've created and with what we have learned and the experience we have from shifting within and receive and letting, frankly, what we see go, the illusion, the maya. We let go of everything that we're looking at and we realize it's not there. Now that's kind of a leap. Yes, to tell somebody what you're looking at in this dimension that it's not even there, it really is not. If you believe what Joel is telling us and what all mystics are telling us and religions are telling us from all over the world that God is love, it's the only power, omnipotence. One of the major principles of the Joel Goldsmith work is omnipotence. The only power that's real, that exists, is the power of God. That's it. Any other power that you might want to connect to, be it the illusion of money or the job or the car or what you think is a power, they don't exist. They're illusions in this dimension when we left eternity. We created this world and we thought, gee, that looks good. 
that looks good, let's try this. This will make me happy. And you know very often what makes us happy lasts for a little while. It might even last a couple of lifetimes because this work requires within the circle to keep coming back because as we need to, we will get better. And let me tell you one thing I'm sure of is what we do take with us when we transition and maybe come back again is permanent. All the work we've done is, is with us. So that's really good news. We're on a journey. We're evolving to the infinite way of life. So let's move on to what the second degree might look like. Uh, Joel brings up the Ten Commandments. Now, what he thinks, and I agree, there are two that really sum everything up. Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Okay, we all know that. The second one is love your neighbor as yourself. Now there's a big one. And all the other ones, the one about the, the, the wife, the lusting, the whatever the other ones are, you can forget those because if you're really gonna love your neighbor as yourself, that's gonna be you know something that all of those sort of p fall into. You're not gonna run off with your neighbor's wife if in fact you're loving your neighbor as yourself. So, now here's a wonderful thing to think about. Think of those neighbors or the folks that you come in touch with that are less than lovely. Maybe they're in jail. Maybe you'd like to judge them because they have sinned. We have a God that does not recognize sin. He does not recognize all the good things you do. Now that's kind of weird, isn't it? That's, you'd like to think we at least had a pat on the back and that when we were bad, God was really breathing down our necks. But when we're good, yeah, you might get a little something. But that if God is the only power and the only presence and the only intelligence, then if God is love, then there's nothing else. So if we look at all these other illusions that, think, that we think will make us happy, they don't exist. The only, and you know what? Once you get into that erasing the illusions, your life might get a little grayer. It might be so peaceful. The rewards, believe me, are there. But it might not have those excitements, those little shots about, oh, I got that job, or look at my new car. And that can hold us for a little while. But you know what? Because they're not who God is, which is complete love, and it's not the eternity that you are trying to get back to, they don't hold up. Your, your, your beer won't hold up, your drug won't hold up, your food addiction won't hold up. Nothing will hold up because after that, all that exhaustion, there is still that yearning for where you once were and that's the gift we've been given. So where we once were, we were, we had the Christ mind. We were joined, I and my Father are one, that's key. He is the known in eternity. We were created. So we're not God, but we are the offspring. My father and I are one. So what the father has, I have. I've inherited everything. Wonderful health, abundance, perfect spiritual partners. My mission, I've inherited a mission. I do believe Joel is right when he says, yes, there's something specific for us to do. And as we grow and change, you might even find a name that works more for you. When I went back to Penelope years ago as a widow, it was just so perfect because I was so young. And I love the name. It's supposedly patience. I am still working on that. And obviously I'm here and growing. But in that second degree, he's talking about how we use those commandments to check ourselves. How am I loving my neighbor? It actually calls us, and it make, can make us quite uncomfortable when we realize, you know, all the things that are expected of us with those two commandments don't always hold true. We don't always pass the mustard. We don't always make it, but as a result of seeing, we're ardent now. We're trying to really be moral and ethical. We're trying not to cheat anybody. We're trying to go the high road on everything with those 10 commandments. We might get a few heads up about ourselves. And if we get those heads up, then we can change. Then we can say, oops, all right, that hurt. I hurt myself in my misperception. So as we go within again to heal the everlasting arms, the love of God, the no judgment, the perfection of who we are greets us and it's very comfortable and peaceful and the still small voice is waiting for us. That, and it's called grace. Uh, that still small voice can really be heard if you do your meditating 
as many times a day as you can. Once you get into the miracle of what happens on your outer, the experience of how your life falls into place, things are happening you didn't expect, you can get kind of hooked on it because it really, really works. The peace is within. And as we go there, the outer matches. Okay, so we've worked on the second dimension. We've worked on our ethics, our morals. We're trying to be good citizens, and all of that is very important. But then we have to move on, and we're, well, let's say we're learning and we're growing. Then what are we going to find? As we continue within Ness, the isness of us, the I am of us, we find grace. Now, grace is an interesting word. It can be even the still small voice. It can be whatever manifests on our outer. They are gifts. God's grace is taking care of us. He made us. He loves us. He wants to give you everything in his kingdom. Everything he has, he's got for you. You've got to go meet him, though, to find it. And we have all left him a lot. We've let him down a lot. We've let ourselves down a lot. And he's still waiting. So as he is waiting, and we are waiting to join with him, that's the most perfect place we can go. So my friends, see what your practice takes you when it comes to grace. Grace is waiting for you. Grace is your life. You're in a parenthesis in this circle of eternity where you were never born, you will never die. The body that you've got is perfectly made. God put every organ, everything together for you. It has been made by him for this particular journey in the parenthesis. I want to bring up uh, Chris Bentley again for those who love the Infinite Way work so I don't forget to bring up his website and suggest if you're a serious Infinite Way students, which is the movement that Joel created from his work. And it's not an organized um, work. It's not a church. It doesn't have politics. The mystical path is the one Jesus walked. He did not want to be a king. He didn't want anybody's money. He didn't want fame. He had to turn it all down. Even when he was tempted at the end of his life to say, you know, spare me, he realized because he was eternal, he was okay. He knew he had a demonstration to give us about eternal life, which, by the way, thousands of years before he did the crucifixion resurrection, it had happened before and had been noticed in the Essene Gospels. There are, there are now studies of where Jesus really was able to get an awful lot of work done. But you know what? His crucifixion had an awful lot to do with wanting mankind, everybody, not just the Hebrews, the Gentiles, everybody should be entitled to the Christ within. So that's where he got into trouble because everyone in their political world around him did not like that. That's where his, his problems began. So my friends, I recommend a parenthesis in eternity. It is so strange that I would pick that book up first because it's not one of the easiest ones, I don't think. It tries to really go even back to cavemen, people looking in the sky, trying to figure out what they're here for. I hope all of us, like myself, I remember being really little, wondering why I was breathing and that I could control it. I could control my secrets. I could keep things to myself. I was quite amazed at my whole being. Uh, I think it's one of the mysteries that I cannot imagine for centuries that mankind didn't have to sort of question, my goodness, what is all this? Why am I here? So <clears throat> then, you know, way, way back, little groups started to form. Somebody had an idea somebody else might like. And you know how truth gets out when it really works? Somebody hears about someone maybe in a cave and somebody who knows something that, you, that has kind of come up for you, so you join them. And before you know it, you have fellowships. You have brotherhoods with no organization, but just folks who need each other and are excited about the miracles in their own lives and the grace that they're receiving. So Joel, as a mystic, he was a Christian scientist. He was a practitioner for, I don't know, he had 38 years between business um, and his Christ, Christian science healing before he branched out. He felt that walking the earth plane should not shut anybody out. 
But if you have walls up, if you have any kind of political stuff going on, it's almost like saying, well, we're exclusive. We've got, what, we've got only what we want and what works for us. He needed to go to where Jesus was wandering and speaking to several as he tried to share the fact that when you see me, you don't see me. You see my Father when you see me. God bless him. He certainly took on an amazing uh, parenthesis. And he's working with all of us. I mean, Joel mentions that all the mystics we've ever known, those that we have studied, everyone is always with us. I have a few mentors that I have lost. And that when I meditate, I just feel their presence, my father especially, and a gal named Joy. Um, they're working with me now. Uh, nobody goes anywhere. You know, when you're eternal, memories, uh, nobody dies. Nobody dies. We make so much out of death. We don't do much around birth because that's always nice, but it's the death that we sort of think is so horrible when it's really an opportunity to just discard a lifetime. We've done what we could with it. Hopefully it was wonderful, and of course it was. We all grow and that we're getting ready for another dimension. Now, where that is, we don't have to know that. We don't even have to know the ones where we have been here before. That's just not important, and we have not been allowed that, which even though I've had glimpses, it's really not important, and it might actually hold us back. I think Joel was more gifted on that, and other folks have been as well. So it's a very interesting journey, my friends. Um, I can only say dying daily is very key. So dying daily is to, when we look out and we see a presence of something that looks like an interpretation that we could turn it into something, like let's say someone's evil or sinful. Even seeing the sin and the evil is not, it's not real, it's not even there. We can't judge it or make something out of it. We have to actually let it go. We have to put everybody that we see in the worst, the worst people in the world are on holy ground. They have a Christ within them like you have. And even if you're in the company of someone that's really driving you nuts, and they're dense or thick or evil, and you can feel, your soul actually feels their presence, just try hard to see who they are. You don't have to say boo, you don't have to tell someone, you don't have to be a martyr saying they're wonderful when they're not. That's not what this is about. That's, that's, doesn't make sense. But you have to acknowledge, just say, I see the Christ in this person and let it go, knowing they're on their journey. They're part of the oneness of you. The worst person that you know is connected to you. Everybody is your mirror. That's helpful when you have to love your neighbor like yourself to see everybody is your mirror. And if you don't like what you're seeing in the mirror, it's because you are looking at it in a way that is not of the purest of love and gifts to one another. We really have to leap. If you want to be a mystic and you want to work and, and live in peace, and believe me, when you experience this, you will get hooked on it because of the grace that manifests around you. So again, the challenge of letting go of the illusion of someone who's lost. If they choose to be lost, that's none of your business. Your business is to not see them lost. Your business is to see them whole, to see that they are connected to the Father like you are. You and your Father are one. This plane, this leaving God, this separation that we created, for thousands of years it has probably crystallized and become even more difficult to cut through. But because it's gotten worse, it's almost getting better because the illusions are getting more absurd. And they're very, almost hard to buy into anymore. Of course, I'm thinking of politics. We gotta keep our sense of humor here. And, and you know, grace gives us joy when we're really happy and, and fulfilled here. We do work. It's not as though we sit and meditate constantly. We have work to do here. We have skills. We might come in as a fine musician. These are gifts given to us. I had a prodigy husband that I lost early who was, had a job at eight. So there's definitely something he was doing before he came in. I've had a real lesson in that. And it's, it's exciting to know that when people surrender, the creative geniuses that have come up with the most amazing things for this planet. Oh, here's another point, my friends. 
the work we're doing now, we're doing for the unborn, not only for those who have left. Consciousness is for the unborn, those here, those who have left. We're all in the circle of eternity. So the work we're doing, look at when you have technology that's so awesome. A, a child is born into that. They didn't have to go back to what cavemen were doing. They, we have libraries. We, know we have all of these sophisticated things that are, are privy to the new folks coming in. And spiritually, the same thing applies. The work that we're doing, anytime you overcome one of your own negative traits, uh, one of your fear thoughts, you're, you're spinning off a vibration that raises, that goes right into consciousness and raises it. All the work that you are doing is for the world. And the world, in our last couple of minutes, the world is yours. Eternity is yours. We all want to go home. And when we get lost, it's okay to get lost because if you read a parenthesis in eternities, you'll see the first degree, the second degree, the third degree. It's a lot of work. But once you overcome a lot of your past, and then you get into your morals and your ethics, and then you get to grace, you know what grace really is? You don't react anymore. If something's terrible, you, you might see it, but it's not as though it registers. I think real grace is you're detached. You understand it, and it's easy to not get overwhelmed even about the, you win a million bucks. Believe it or not, you can be detached like that's not the end of the world. Um, there is no end to the world. You were never born. You're not going anywhere. And frankly, I'd like to just say today that I hope you all understand there is something special for you to do. And whatever it is, be sure you love it. Because God's given you talents and abilities. And as you let go of what isn't you, it's wonderful. You might change your name. You might change your profession in midstream. You might do something crazy. You don't live on yesterday's mana. You de if you meditate yesterday and you had this great insight, don't bring that into today because it's a white page day. When you meditate, there's something brand new. That was yesterday. You live in the moment, you live in the now, and in the now is eternity. That's pretty nice. Every now you've got is perfect. The love of God is with you. You are one with the Father. And as you go within, you're guided moment by moment 24-7. And you are to listen to that intelligence because it is omniscience. It's the only intelligence that there is. That's the voice that can guide you. And I thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today on Awaken the Dream. I look forward to talking to you again soon.